You may be seated. God is worthy. We could praise him from the rising of the sun, Brother Chandler, to the going down of the same, which should be an awesome praise and worship service, and he would still be worthy of more. We could start this very moment and praise him from this moment on and forevermore, and he'd be worthy of more. We could praise him with every breath as long as we live, and he still would be worthy of more. So clap your hands, all ye people. Let us shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. And uh, rarely do I do anything <laughs> on a poisonal nature because I try to give everything in the service to God because your time is so valuable. And uh, so I try to just stick with the message God gave me and not use any time um, doing, you know, preliminary stuff. But tonight, I just got to do this <laughs> because you don't understand. Uh, I first came to Alabama in 1987 and had the privilege of preaching a five-week revival with uh, Brother Cooley, Linda Cooley's father. And Linda Cooley was the worship leader at the time my first revival in Alabama. Then I went to Mobile, Alabama in 1988 with Henry McDuffie. Had an eight-week revival there. 486 people got saved. And um, I've been having the privilege of coming back ever since for right at 30 years. But tonight marks a first time. <laughs> tonight, I have spent more time in Alabama since 1987 than I have in my own home. So I said last night that I'm an Alabamian by transference. And listen, guys, I, I understand this. This is serious stuff. People would come to me and say, you can't be from Alabama, for your accent betrays you. And I would try to tell them, I am too from Alabama. I, you go straight up 65 north to Lake Michigan. I'm from North Alabama, and you just. <laughs> but tonight, I don't know if I'm going to mess my microphone up or not, but if I do, Brother Joey's going to rehook me up, Bishop Joey. But I've just got to do this. I've just got to do this because when this happens to a guy from North Alabama, Chicago, North Alabama, and this happens, and they give you one of these, friend, you are now in the family. Now, now you are in the family, and uh, because y'all don't give these away very often. And uh, what I find really special about it, you know, Mary Hartwick is good like a medicine. I don't think we should make light of serious matters. But at the same time, I think it's very dangerous, Brother Chandler, if we start taking ourselves too seriously, when you can't laugh at yourself. And I wanted to come tonight, and, and God knew my heart, and thank you, and tell you how grateful I am that I've had the privilege of coming to Journey for the last 10 years. Most every year in there, minus one or two of them, I've had the honor of serving some of the finest, most hungry most gracious people on the planet Earth. And I knew what I was going to say before church. So I take this as a symbolic thing to me because I was going to thank you for allowing me to become a part of your family and for all of you at Journey for becoming a part of my family. And this choice just makes me feel like I am a part of the family. Thank you so very much. Thank you so very much. And, and the Bible teaches us clearly to give honor where honor is due. I look at this brother, Brother Chandler, and I want to say to him from the Holy Ghost, this is no longer a man speaking, but this Holy Ghost speaking. Had you not been faithful, had you not stayed true to the message God gave you, the churches of America would be in a lot worse shape 
than what they are right now. And because of men like you, there's still a remnant of churches that are spirit-filled and spirit-thrilled and believe in the full counsel of God's Word. Would you give Brother Chandler a hand of appreciation for a lifetime of dedication and, and sanctification and consecration and giving his life to the holy calling of Christ Jesus. There are so few like him. There are so few like him. Father God, I want to thank you that you've allowed me the privilege of coming to your people tonight with a very, very special message. Last night, God, you dealt with us very strongly that if America does not repent, that these things happening in the weather particularly was localized judgment, not to punish people, but to get their attention, that if they do not repent, then the really bad judgment is going to come. But I thank you, Lord, that your word declares that judgment starts in the house of God. And that when we, your children, see these things happening in the world, we can use good judgment and we can turn to you and seek your face like our life depended on it. And when we do that, God, your word promises that you will hear us from heaven. And if there are sins to be forgiven, you will forgive those sins and you will heal the land. We thank you, Master, that you will heal the land of those that seek your face. And I thank you. I'm amongst the people tonight that seek your face. Would somebody give the Lord a hand clap of praise and thank him right now. Thank him right now. Thank him right now. Yes. 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 You may be seated. I have a very important message to a very, very important people. In 1 Peter, or chapter 2, voice 9, these are the people that I'm addressing tonight. 1 Peter, chapter 2, voice 9. But ye are chosen generation. All week long, I did not intend this. It's not something I thought up. But I believe the hungry church of today is the revelation generation. They are the body of Christ that existed in Revelation chapter 3, 14 through 22, who have not lost their hunger and thirst for God, but they're more hungry today. How many are more hungry today than when you got saved? How many are more thirsty today than when you got saved? Then praise him right now for those that hunger and thirst after righteous shall be filled. <clears throat> and in the midst of the falling away, the Bible made it clear that there would be a remnant that God would be so pleased with that would make him Lord, that would open the door to his lordship and kingship in their life, that he would be so pleased that he himself would come and sup with them, and they would sup with him. Can you imagine the kind of spiritual meal that God has prepared for those that are hungry? How many are hungry for the revelation of God's word? Now, everybody turn to the poison next to you and say, last night was spinach, but tonight we're going to be the chocolate cake. And guys, I take, listen, listen. These kids are getting something out of this. You know how I know they're getting something out of this? Because pastor's daughter came up to me last night, looked me straight in the eyes, a serious heart attack, and said, are you really going to give out chocolate cake tomorrow night? <laughs> they're listening. They're listening. And so spiritually I am. In, 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 second, in voice Peter, chapter 2, voice 9. Can you pull that back up for me, please? Or did I, did I fry the slide? No? Yes? Yes. But ye are a chosen generation. Ye are a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. Leave that up. We're in this world, but we're not of this world. I, I'm an American. I love my country. I believe I died for my country. I'm proud to be in the most blessed nation on the planet Earth. But I also recognize that there's some things that I can't be a part of. 
I'm not going to cause a riot. I'm not going to break the law. I'm not going to harm people. But there are things that I'm not going to be a part of. Why? Because before I'm an American, I'm a part of another country. I'm of a holy nation. I'm of the nation of God. And somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. We're in this world, but we're not of it. But ye are chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. That word peculiar doesn't mean strange or weird. It means special. How many are glad that you are special to God? So much so that you're the nation of the kingdom of God. That means heaven and earth will pass away, but God's word will never pass away. And because you're a part of the nation of God, you have the agenda of God. You're a part of something that's bigger than yourself that will have eternal meaning and people's lives. Aren't you glad that you've been the part of somebody being saved? Aren't you glad that you've been a part of a Holy Ghost revival that will turn this nation back around? And he said, you're a peculiar people that ye should show praise and false praises unto him who have called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. How many remember where God bought you from? Would you show praises unto him right now from bringing you out of that dark place into his marvelous light? Last night, God spoke to us, and I'm going to go so far as to say this. Everybody wave at me. You do not want to miss and get a set of the CDs or DVDs so you can do the follow-up and listen to this stuff again. But I want to share with you God spoke to us about his judgment, the localized judgment coming out of America. But as long as God is preaching repentance and people will repent, God will withhold that judgment, I believe, until after the rapture. And the localized judgment is a warning from God, not a condemnation of the bad stuff that will happen if we continue on the path we're on. The remnant in this room is not continuing on that path. I believe the last real for sure prophet that the United States had was a man by the name of David Wilkerson. And David Wilkerson said right before his tragic death in a car wreck that God's judgment was going to come on the United States of America for its partation of breaking the covenant with God and that judgment would come in the form of a complete economic collapse. In other words, if your source is this world, you're probably in trouble. But if your source is God, God will supply all your need according to Listen to where I'm going. But God has spoken to me just as he did to Amos. Or, and you remember in the, the when, when, oh, the, Ahab, when God said to Ahab that God was so upset with him that you're going to die, and not only you're going to die, all of your seed's going to die, and your sons are going to die. And God spoke, and Ahab got so scared. He set his face to fast and repent, and he humbled himself before God. There's no record that Ahab became a true believer, but because he humbled himself, God sent the prophet and said to the prophet, because Ahab repented that God was going to withstand the whole battle that judgment until Ahab was dead. Saints of God, I submit to you that if God will respond to a man as evil and wicked as Ahab was just because he fasted and prayed out of fear of the judgment of God, how much more will God respond to his children that seek his face right now? Oh, somebody give the Lord a hand clap of praise. So does that. I believe that God's judgment will come, but I believe if God's people, the remnant, will turn and seek God's face like our lives depend on it, that that judgment will be withheld, the bad part of it, until after the rapture of the choice. How many of you know that this world's going to come to an end? There's going to be a new heaven, and there's going to somebody give the Lord a hand clap of praise. That's what this message is about. You've been chosen to bring false praises. Now, turn to Ezekiel chapter 3, voice number 21. This is where we left off last night. God just got done speaking to Israel. And they said, he says, the reason why Jerusalem has been burned to the ground, the temple's been destroyed, 
the king's been a POW for five years. Just like the book of Lamech, the reason why your sons and daughters lay dead in the street, there's been a total collapse of the country. The reason is, is because that Israel had rebelled against God and his covenant and God's word. I shared last night that I felt like America has broken its covenant with God. In three, I won't go over the complete message. This just brings you up to where we left off last night. And it says here in Ezekiel chapter 3, and remember, guys, the, one, the book of Ezekiel, the last several chapters ends with a prophecy about Israel's glorious future. In other words, God is a God of grace and God is a God of mercy. God would much rather show mercy and grace to a people that will repent than he would, oh, somebody shout hallelujah. If God was in the judgment, he would have just let all of us die in our sins and go to hell. But how many are glad tonight that God so loved you? that he gave his only begotten son. Oh, somebody shout hallelujah. It says, nevertheless, if thou will warn the righteous man, that's our job. We don't judge people. We proclaim truth. There's a huge difference. Nevertheless, if thou will warn the righteous man, in other words, somebody that lived a godly life, the chosen Israel were God's chosen people. They knew God's law. They knew God's word. They had seen their ancestors, had seen him manifested in such a way that he was a fire over them by night, the size of the state of Rhode Island. There, he was a cloud over them by day. Their ancestors talked about the parting of the Red Sea and all the miracles that God had done. How many know tonight that you serve a God tonight that still saves, he still delivers, and he still heals? Somebody shout hallelujah. And so I, I'm going to hurry. If thou will warn the righteous man, notice if thou Guys, it's our job to proclaim truth. If nevertheless, although he says pretty much in chapter 2 and chapter 3 that all this has happened because they were rebellious, hard-hearted, and stiff-necked and broke the covenant. But look what he says, Brother Chandler, at the end of that strong, stout rebuke. Nevertheless, if thou will warn the righteous man that the righteous men sin not, I believe that's what's going to come down to. I think there's going to be remnants and pockets of revival in every state in the United States where the people that are really hungry for a divine encounter with God can find the full counsel of God, can find a place where people, oh, somebody shout, man, God is just flowing. He's just speaking to me so fast, I, I, I can't even keep up. Nevertheless, if thou will warn the righteous man and that that righteous man sin not and he does not, doth, doth not sin, he shall surely live. Not everybody you witness to is going to get saved, but everyone that does will live and not die. That's why we do what we're doing. We're not trying to win a popularity contest. We're trying to rescue men and women from a burning hell. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. He shall surely live. Be why will he live, Brother Joey? Because he is warned. So if churches are not preaching the full counsel of God's word, then they're not going to receive the warning. They're not going to repent because they're not going to think they have anything to repent of. Therefore, they're not going to live. Guys, it's a matter of life and death because he shall surely live because he is warned. And also he that has delivered and also thou has delivered thy soul. In other words, if you share the truth, people reject it. You still re re delivered your soul from judgment. If they receive it, they get to live and you delivered your soul from judgment. It's important what we tell people. Notice the next voice, please. And the hand of the Lord was there upon me. And he said unto me, arise and go forth to the plain. Guys, I'm the least of God's servants, but I know who I am. I'm a servant of the Most High God. And I'm seeing something, Pam. I see God's hand coming on men and women all across this country, all different backgrounds, all different educational levels, all, some from different countries, from different parts of the world, but God's hand's upon them, and God's hand, and that message is the same. Turn to God. Seek the face of God. He will hear us from heaven. He will forgive our sin, and he will heal our land. And the hand of God was there upon me and said unto me, Arise and go forth into the plain. <clears throat> God spoke to me. Brother Joey is one of my dearest friends in the ministry. I love Alabama. You're my family. But I'm here by divine appointment. 
God spoke to me months ago about this supernatural camp meeting. And God spoke to me during a time of fasting and prayer that he was going to raise up churches in small venues, in small towns. Why? Because they're not ashamed of the Holy Ghost. They're not ashamed of the full counsel of God's Word. They're not ashamed of praise and worship. He would like to do that in the big cities, but most of the big cities are too arrogant and too proud to repent and turn to God. And God spoke to me that he was going to raise up the smaller venues in smaller towns, and it's those churches that were going to turn America back around and save it from annihilation. And I'm speaking to one of those churches. And the hand of the Lord was there upon me. And he said unto me, Arise and go forth into the plain, and I will, I will there talk with thee. God, I believe with all my heart, Sister Kim, sent me this week to Eva, Alabama. If he spoke to nobody else, God has spoken to me. And I, I believe that the rest is going to be the best. How many believe the rest of your life is going to be the best as far as the spiritual end of it? But notice the next voice. He says, I'm going to send you somewhere, and I'm going to talk to you. Then I arose, then I arose, and I went forth into the plain. I arose, and I went to Eva. And every night, God has gloriously showed up. How many have been here just about every night? Has not God been glorious every single night? Would you give him a hand of appreciation? He don't have to show up. Then I arose and went forth into the plain. And behold, the glory of the Lord. The word glory means God's manifest presence. And he said, behold, I saw God's manifest presence. And the glory of the Lord stood there. God stopped. Sometimes God will move, and other times God will stop. But whenever God stops, it's to give instructions. It's to give direction. It's to point you in the right direction. And the Lord stood there as the glory of which I saw at the river Chabar. Leave that up for just a moment. And I fell on my face. He got slayed out under the power of God. The important thing is here, notice what the prophet says. This is not the first time that I saw God's manifest presence. This is not the first time God spoke to me. I've seen this before. Now I'm going to take you to when God first revealed. Listen to this, guys. This spirit of a message is as important as the message itself. Why? Because God gave a stern message here in chapter 2 and 3 of the book of Ezekiel. So the spirit of that message is very important. And when you see it, you'll understand why. In Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 27 and 28, and I saw the color of amber. This is what Ezekiel is referring to in chapter 3, when he saw the glory of God before. And I saw as the color of amber, as the appearance of fire round about within it. In other words, the person that Ezekiel sees here in his eyes is aflamed. How many of you know that your God is a consuming fire? And he saw, he saw God, he saw Jesus, and he's, he's on fire. He's, he's, he's bursting out in flames. And I saw as the color of amber as the appearance of fire round about within it, from the appearance of his loins even upward. I seen him, and he was on fire from his waist up the, like the color of amber. And from appearance of his loins, even downward, from head to toe, he is a consuming fire. And I saw, as it were, the appearance of fire, and it had brightness round about. This is significant because this is the same vision that they have of Jesus Christ in the book of Revelations after the rapture of the church during the great tribulation period. Saints of God, there are some things that we can shout about tonight that will never change. Jesus is the same. Yes yesterday, today, and forever, and he changes not. Now, what is so important here is the next thing that, say, that we see here. In other words, the spirit of the message is as important as the message itself. I can have the exact right message. I can preach about hell and preach it with such love that I don't want anyone to go there and they'll receive that message and get saved because of the spirit of the messenger. Thus it is here. Notice in voice 28. 
as the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud of the day of the rain. He saw a rainbow. So was the appearance of the brightness round about. When you see Jesus in the book of Revelation on the throne of heaven, you not only see Jesus like this, but you see the very rainbow being referred to. This goes back to the covenant of Noah. When God made a covenant with the entire human race and every living creature. And that covenant was that I will never destroy the planet earth again with the flood. In other words, this is God about to say some really convicting things to Ezekiel to say to the children of God. But before Ezekiel brings that message, God reminds him of the covenant of the rainbow, that God would rather show mercy than bring judgment. How many believe that America is at that crossroad right now, either the judgment of God or the mercy of God? How many would prefer the mercy of God? Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad that God is about to say some pretty convicting, hard things? But before he says it, he reminds the prophet, shows him, I'm going to speak to you. My manifest presence, I'm going to appear and speak to you as a man speaks to another man. And I'm going to say some things to bring the people to repentance. But before I say anything, I want to remind you of the rainbow of my mercy and my grace that I will show to everyone that will humble themselves. Aren't you glad tonight that God's mercy is available? Oh, somebody shout Hallelujah. And this was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. So we know it's Jesus. And when I saw it, I fell on my face. Ezekiel spent a lot of time getting slayed out. And I fell on my face, and I heard a voice of one that spake. Now he takes him from here, and he shows him Ezekiel 2 and 3 as to why the judgment had come upon the people. But before he did it, he revealed his mercy and his grace. How many of you know in all your heart that God will not judge the righteous with the wicked? If we will respond to God's word, we'll be the recipient of his mercy and grace. And also, saints, the book of Ezekiel does deal strongly with them about their sin and the breaking of their covenant. Covenant, but the glorious ending of it is Israel being renewed to a new glorious future. Saints of God, there's no question judgment's coming. The only question is, who's it going to come on? Somebody want to throw up your hands right now and say, as for me and my house, I'm going to serve the Lord, and the judgment ain't coming to my house. In Ezekiel chapter, chapter 37, beginning with voice 1, he had just got done telling them all these things that they were guilty of. But notice now what the prophet says here. And keep in mind the covenant that goes back to the day of Noah. And the hand of the Lord was upon me. And he carried me out in the spirit of the Lord. I believe we live in an hour, Bishop Joey, that ministers today more than ever. Need to be spirit led, spirit fed, spirit. How many believe that? How many believe that Christians today need to be under the influence of the Holy Ghost as never before? Because these are perilous times. If you believe that, give the Lord a hand clap of praise. <laughs> and the hand of the Lord, I've got a revelation for you. I've got an awesome rhema for you. And the, and the, and the hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones. You know, some, some teachers, theologians believe that it was the valley of Megiddo. If it was, it was a huge valley. Y'all know this story, but I believe God's given me some rhema tonight on this. Notice voice number two. And he caused me to pass by them round about. He took a real close look at the spiritual decay of Israel that God had revealed to him. Now he shows them a physical manifestation of the spiritual decay, the result of it, which is this valley full of dead bones. Notice what the prophet does. He just doesn't spring into action, but he takes an assessment. He walks around that valley. He observes it. He looks it over. He sees just how bad the situation is before he, he makes a plan of action. How many of you know that God's going to work through people in these last days? And he's going to look for people that will be a people of action. How many want to be a person of, of action? And he caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, there were very many in an open valley. And lo, they were very dry. 
Now, I know that I'm not talking to churches like that here tonight. I know that I'm preaching to the choir. But how many of you know that we're surrounded by churches that have lost their first love? That we're surrounded by churches that once were on fire, but God himself describes as lukewarm. Saints of God, I used to say, Brother John, will lukewarm Christians make it in the rapture? It's not up for me to decide who's going to make it in the rapture, but I'm going to just tell you how I feel about it for my life. I would not want to try to go to heaven on a relationship with God that is so bad it makes him vomit. I mean, I, I wouldn't want to try. Are you hearing what I'm saying? This is serious stuff. And he caused me to pass around about them. And guys, I'm telling you, some of the spiritual, con guys, Pam showed it to me today, the U.S. News today. We went in just like six months from 40% of the people or 60% of the people in America being against gay marriage. Now 60% are for gay marriage. It all depends where you do your survey. If I'm standing in front of a gay bar interviewing everybody that comes out, I'm probably. <laughs> but I can't believe, I don't want to believe that they're surveying the church. Someone throw your hands in the air right now and say, I'm a part of the largest minority on the planet Earth. I'm a part of the church. And we're the, oh, somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. And he calls me to pass by, a, a, around about them. And behold, there were very many in open valley, and lo, they were very dry. Notice voice number three. And he said unto me, son of man, have you ever had God ask you a question? that you can't possibly answer. God asked the prophet a question here. And the prophet, he can't possibly answer it, but I think he gives the best answer you could and certainly one of great wisdom and discernment. When I look at America, there are a lot of people, Brother Joey says, we've gone too far. There's a lot of people that says there's no hope for revival for this country, that we've just gone too far away from God. And I myself find myself looking as I appraise the situation as a minister of the gospel, and, and I'm looking at these dry bones, and I'm looking at the, the, what was once on fire, and now it's lukewarm, and I'm thinking to myself, is there any hope or revival for our country? And that's pretty much where the prophet is here. And he said unto me, son of man, can these bones live? And notice the prudent answer he gives. And I answered, oh, Lord God, Thou knowest. I don't know, Brother Chandler, if there can be a revival from coast to coast, border to border, to turn this nation upside right. But I know someone who does. God, you know. Don't ever, ever, somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Don't ever underestimate the power of the divine Holy Ghost revival because there was a teenage king back in the Old Testament, Josiah by name, who turned his nation back to God in one day. We serve a God that can send the fire of the Holy Ghost on this country and turn it around. Oh, somebody give the Lord a hand clap of praise. God knows. And then God, who's the only one that can answer this question, begins to answer the question himself. How many want to see America saved? How many want to see a revival sweep this country, a revival of holiness, a revival of the Holy Ghost and power and the full control of God's word? Notice voice four. And again, he said unto me, somebody raise your hand and say, this is a son of man. He's just a servant of God. But the words he speaks are not his words. They're the words of God. And I'm going to receive it as if God himself is speaking to me. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. And look at the power of the preached word. And again, he said unto me, prophesy unto these bones. <laughs> I think coming into Eva, there's a choice of Christ on the right. I'm not referring to the choice of Christ, but just to the right of it, if you're driving into Eva, there's a cemetery, and I know some people think that I'm a little strange, and when I see my DVDs, I think I'm a lot strange, and some people may think Bishop Joey's a little strange, and Brother Chandler or any spirit-filled preacher, but how strange would you think we were if you drove by that Church of Christ tomorrow 
and Brother Joe is on one end, and I'm on the other end, and one of these other preachers on the other end, and we're preaching up, we're, we're preaching the paint off the wall, and we're preaching to a bunch of tombstones, we're preaching to a bunch of headstones, we're preaching to a bunch of... We may seem strange to some folks, but at least we're not out in a cemetery preaching to a bunch of dead bodies. And again, he said on me, preach, preach. The word prophesied there, someone say, tell me what it means. The word prophesied there means to speak under divine inspiration. It means to decree, to make a proclamation. It means to declare something as if it was already done. And God has given us a clue to the power of God's word. God's word is powerful and it's quick and it's changing lives even if you don't realize it. And again, he said unto me, prophesy unto these bones. Can these bones live again? Can America come back to life again? Can we have a Holy Ghost revival? I believe if the preachers of this country start speaking unto those dead bones as start declaring <laughs> prophesy to these bones and he doesn't just say preach he tells them what to preach and he said say unto them oh ye dry bones hear the word of the Lord everybody wave at me there ain't a dry bone in this place but there's a lot of choices in America that are drier than cracker juice can they live again and God says you know, and I say, God, you know, and then God's response is, they can't live again. All I need is some men that will declare, thus saith the Lord. Yeah. Prophesying these bones and saying to them, oh, ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. What did God say? Notice the next voice. And he saith, thus saith the Lord unto these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. I believe there's hope for America. Amen. But the only hope for this country is a Holy Ghost revival. God, the word breath, it means a violent wind. I'm going to give you the Hebrew in, um, definition because the English just doesn't do it justice. It means a violent wind. It means the spirit of life. It means a blast and a tempest. That's why on the day of Pentecost, there came a sound from heaven like a mighty Russian wind. But this wind is just not a great northerner. This wind is not a tornado or a hurricane. This wind is the breath of of life. It is the very breath of God himself. It is the person of the Holy Ghost. Can these bones live again? God says they can, but you've got to preach my word, and then my spirit has to bring life. Oh, somebody get along. There has to be a move of the Holy Ghost. And I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. Everybody throw your hands up in the air. And say, dear God, let there be a revival in this country of the word of God. Let there be a revival in this country of the Holy Ghost. God send Holy Ghost revival to the United States of America, to every church that's hungry, to every church that's thirsty. You don't care about the denomination. You don't care. Oh, somebody give the Lord. I But it all started with the preaching of the word. Now notice voice number six. And I will lay sinew, speak unto these bones, that God's Holy Ghost is going to breathe the life of God back into it. Not only am I going to do that, I'm going to do a creative miracle. I will lay sinew upon you, and I will bring up flesh upon you and cover you with skin. How many believe that your God still does creative miracles? That God can make something out of nothing. All it takes is one. Do you know, saints of God, I just got to tell you this. You're one breath from a whole new you. You're one breath from a healed you. You're one breath from a delivered you. You're... And I will lay sin you upon you and bring up flesh upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and ye shall live and ye shall know that I am 
the Lord. How many believe that the Holy Ghost will not only produce life, but it will do a creative miracle? How many want God to breathe his life once again into this country? Amen. Notice voice 7. So I prophesied. I didn't declare the word of God by my inspiration. I declared it under divine inspiration. I didn't say what I thought needed to be said. I said what God said needed to be said. So I prophesied, saying to God, I am the least of God's servants. And I honestly believe that every preacher here has forgotten more about God than I know. But the only thing I know to do every time I get in this pulpit is to the very best of my ability, give you what God commanded me. It's not an option to me. I don't just go through sermon books till I come up with an idea. I want to know the mind of God. I want to bring you what thus saith. And then it's, see, God will confirm his word with signs following. When we begin to preach what God commands us to preach, then we can expect God to breathe on it. Then we can expect God to do creative miracles. I've got news for you. Somebody in this room that's got a sickness in your body or had a sickness in your body, throw your hand up right now. Throw it up right now. Do you know all you need is for God to breathe one time upon you and you're not going to be sick anymore? Do you know you serve a God? So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, I believe God can do miracles even while I'm speaking. I believe as I speak, and I said, somebody in this room, I said the word creative miracle. You thought to yourself, you know what? I need a new liver. I need a new ticker. I need a new, I need, and I believe at that moment, you may not have realized it. I don't realize it, but the Holy Spirit started breathing on that word inside you, producing that creative miracle. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a shaking, and bones came together, bone to his bone. To the untrained eye, they walk into a Pentecostal service, and they see all these people dancing and shouting, slayed out on the floor, power of God being manifested, and it freaks them out, Bishop, and they don't know what to think, and they think it's disorder, but if you could see in the spirit, God is a God of order. He don't put a hand bone on my shoulder. He don't put a neck bone on my ankle. Everything God does when he shakes up the house, he puts things the way they ought to be. How many of you know we can trust the Holy Ghost? He ain't going to mess it up. Now notice voice 8. <coughs> and when I beheld, lo, the sinew in the flesh came up upon them, and the skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. I liken this to the lukewarm choice that God redresses in the book of Revelation 3. They once had fire. I liken this to those that lost their first love. They looked all right on the outside. They looked like a choice. They sang like a choice. They talked like choice people. There was only one thing missing. There was no spirit. <laughs> there was no life. Guys, we call that a religious spirit. I don't want to look choicey. I don't want to just look like a choice. I want to be the choice. I'm not, I'm not satisfied looking like a cleaned up person. I want to have the life of God inside of me. Do you see that? Jesus called it white at sepulchers. Notice the next voice. So what do I do now? God, you said speak the word of God. I spoke it. You started a creative miracle. You touched it. Obviously, sin you grew. They were, they were back. Something happened, but there's no spirit in them. Somewhere along the line, they lost that breath. Somewhere along the line, they got that touch that got them this far and said, that's as far as I'm going to go. I, I'm just sharing what I feel the Lord's put in my heart. And then Brother Bishop Joey, Brother Chandler, God showed me something in his word that I feel like the most unworthy person to have discovered this golden nugget. But there it is. If you will preach God's word as God commands, unapologies. If you'll stand up for the things God stands up for. If you'll love the things God loves and hate the things God hates. If you'll do things God's way, 
This is what God says I give you authority to do. And he said unto me, prophesy. Speak under divine inspiration. To who? Prophesy under the wind. Command the Holy Spirit. Speak to the Holy Spirit under divine directive from me. Saints of God, you don't throw this privilege around loosely, but those that are doing things God's way, that are dependent on God's power, have the privilege of speaking to the Holy Ghost and commanding. I didn't write it. God's word says it. Then said he unto me, prophesy unto the wind. Declare under divine inspiration to the Holy Ghost what needs to be done. Well, let me start. Holy Spirit, I have done my best to obey the Father this week. And I speak, Holy Ghost, to come from the north, the south, and the east, and the west. And heal every sick body in this room. I speak, Holy Ghost, to give back love joy, and peace to every depressed person inside this room. I speak, Holy Ghost, make whole that which is broken. Give joy. Oh, somebody shout hallelujah. I speak, Holy Ghost, to come from the north, the south, the east, and the west and bring our children back to the house of God once again. I speak, Holy Ghost, produce divine Holy Ghost revival in the United States of America. <laughs> Prophesy under the wind. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the spirit, thus saith the Lord, there is no competition in the Godhead. Jesus is God as much as the Father is. But he, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by him, and without Jesus was not anything made. But while he was on the planet Earth, he glorified the Father. And now Jesus was glorified on the cross and was risen from the dead. And the Holy Spirit glorifies or magnifies the Son. So there's no competition in the Godhead. This message came from the Father through the Son, and now God's saying to us, if you'll do it my way, I give you the authority to speak to the Spirit to perform what the Son came to the planet Earth to do. For this purpose was the Son of God manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Somebody give the Lord. <laughs> now, please bear with me. Then said he unto me, prophesy unto the wind, speak under divine inspiration. Expect the Holy Ghost to back up the message. Prophet, when I pray for you in this altar in a few minutes, I'm going to pray for you expecting the Holy Ghost to back up the message, breathe life in that situation. Say to the wind, thus saith the Lord, God the Father, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these that were slain. They once were alive. I don't know how America ended up like this, but I know once America was a Christian nation alive by the power of God. But I know in most places it's dead. But I speak under divine inspiration to the Holy Ghost. Breathe upon those that were slain. Breathe upon those that were once alive that are no, oh, somebody shout hallelujah. Breathe upon these slain that they may live. Voice 10. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And part of that command was to speak boldly to the Holy Ghost. I can't do this without you. Now bear with me because I got a promise for you that's going to, how many expect to leave here? Breathe on by the Holy Spirit. How many expect the Holy Spirit to breathe his creative power into you? How many believe that God's life is going to be breathed into your dead end street, your dead situation, that dead child, that, oh, somebody. How many believe that God's going to breathe on that hopeless, impossible situation that you're facing right now? And that which looks dead, God's going to bring it back to life because God. So I prophesied as he commanded me. 
and breath came into them, and they lived and stood up on their feet, an exceeding great army. I believe that God is going to stir his preachers to preach his word as he commands it. Then God is going to stir his preachers to speak to the Holy Spirit and to call him in from every direction. And the Holy Spirit is going to breathe on those that once were alive but now are slain. And they're going to come back to life again. But they're not just coming back to life. They're going to come back to life as a mighty army going across this land, taking this. Now bear with me. I'm going to hurry. Notice the next voice. You guys have been so good. Then he said unto me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. That includes you, me, because we're now part of the tribe of Israel. This is the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say our bones are dried. Our hope is lost. We are cut off from our parts. I'm facing a dead end street. There's no way my body's going to be healed. There's no way that child's going to get saved. There's no way the nation's going to come back to God. So many people come to that place where they think it's dead and impossible. And God says there's an answer. The answer is my word, and the answer is my Holy Spirit. Now notice the next voice. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, all my people, I will open your graves. I know that talks about the rapture, but it talks about here and now. How do you know? Because scripture is always prophecy is fulfilled, and it goes on being fulfilled. On the day of Pentecost, what did Peter stand up and say? This is that which is spoken by the prophet Joel, that in the latter days there will be an outpouring of God's spirit upon our flesh. That prophecy was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost, but every one of us that received the Holy Ghost since that day has been a fulfillment of that fulfillment. And let me tell you something, there's going to be a rapture, but before that rapture, God's going to resurrect some dead vision. God is going to resurrect some dead dreams. Oh, somebody shout. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, O my people, I will open up your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. He's done that. He's fulfilled this prophecy. We look at it right now over in the Middle East. Notice the next voice, but there's more. And ye shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your dead graves, whatever that situation to you that looks impossible, that looks dead, that looks hopeless, this is God speaking to the bones right now. I speak life into that dead situation. I breathe my creative power. And somebody give the Lord. And I'm going to close right here. One voice. One voice. How's God going to do this? And you shall put my... And, and shall put my spirit. So this cannot be referring only to the rapture. Because you're only going to go in the rapture if that same spirit that quickened Christ Jesus quickens your mortal body. This is folks on the planet Earth that need something. And I shall put my spirit in you. And you shall live. And I shall place you in your own land of influence, Eva, and thereabouts. Then shall ye know that I, the Lord, have spoken it. And performed it. That word perform means in the Hebrew. Someone give the Lord a hand clap of praise by faith. <laughs> what do you hear this? That word perform means in the Hebrew to accomplish, to, to, to advance, to appoint, to bestow, to bring forth with certainty, to execute a plan to finish, to fulfill, to bring, to pass, to perform through and by sacrifice. God said every word of this prophecy, I will bring the pass in your life, no matter how bad the situation looks, and I'm going to bring it to pass through 
sacrifice. Today we offer up the sacrifice of praise to honor the Lamb of God who was slain before the foundation of the world. And God said through the prophet over 2,000 years ago, I'm going to bring life back into those dead churches. I'm going to bring life back into that dead country. I'm going to bring life back into your dead situation. And I, the Lord, am going to perform it, and I'm going to perform it through and by sacrifice. Do you understand that God is eternal? He's in the past, present, and future all at the same time that Jesus, in the eyes of the Father, Jesus, 2,000, thousands of years ago, had already died on the cross, had already been buried, had already rose from the dead. In the eyes of Jesus, he's the Lamb of God that was slain before the foundation of the world. And God saying that I, the Lord, am going to perform it through my Son, Jesus Christ. I'm going to... God said, my son has already paid the sacrifice. My son, I will perform everything that was paid for through his sacrifice. And the father saw Jesus as already risen. Jesus saw himself as already slain. And he said, can America live again? <laughs> Not in itself it can, but it sure can through the resurrected son of, oh, somebody. We, this is what the Holy Ghost told me to do. Oh, this is what the Holy Ghost told me to do. The first, I don't want to put a number on it because it would limit but the first bunch of you to get up here, God has commissioned me to preach what he commanded. I've done that to the best of my ability. But God also com commissioned me to speak to the Holy Ghost on your behalf. And what I'm telling you, you, you don't understand. I don't understand. His ways are greater than my ways. He, he, his foolishness is wiser than I. And my, all the wisdom of man is but foolishness to God. But God said, when you come up tonight, that I'm to speak to that Holy Ghost. And he's going to perform whatever Jesus paid for. I will perform it. Son, come here. Come here, son. Come on. Need a couple ushers to come. In the name of Jesus, throw your hands up, son. I breathe, I breathe creative power. There it is. You don't understand. When I speak tonight, I'm not going to speak as a man. I'm going to speak, I'm going to speak, and I'm going to command, prophesy under the divine, divine inspiration to the Holy Ghost to breathe his creative power. How many of you need a creative miracle in your life? How many need a creative miracle? Throw your hands up right now. If you if you need that, jump to your feet right now and then run to this altar. Just run, just don't, don't, don't walk, run, 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 run.